Good afternoon and welcome to the Trade Association of America's 2021 virtual conference. I'm Angela Sullivan, Medical Project Manager at the TAA, and I will be the moderator for this session. Thank you so much for joining us for Emotional Overload, Understanding Non-Tick Behaviors in Tourette Syndrome. I'd like to take a moment to thank our sponsors, the Warner Fund and Pharma, as well as our donors and supporters for making this free conference possible. To support educational programming like this, you may visit Tourette.org slash donate to contribute today. During the session, we'd be very happy to hear from you and include your voice in the conversation. You may ask questions or share comments using the questions panel on the right side of your GoToWebinar at any time. We will collect your questions and address them during the Q&A session at the end of the presentation. It is my pleasure to introduce our presenters this afternoon, Drs. Jan Rao and Heather Simpson. Dr. Rao is a previous faculty member at the University of Alabama at Birmingham. While on faculty, she served in administrative teaching and research positions while continuing to practice in pediatrics. In 2010, with an increased focus in pediatrics, program development, and service to underserved populations, Dr. Rao was the first occupational therapist to develop and coordinate a behavioral program for children with tic disorders and Tourette syndrome. Following retirement from UAB in 2012, Dr. Rao moved, to, moved the CBIT program to Children's of Alabama a center of excellence designated by the Tourette Association of America. Dr. Rao currently serves on the Medical Advisory Board for the TAA and is a co-director of the Children's Tourette Syndrome Center of Excellence. Dr. Simpson is an occupational therapist at the UF Health Fixel Institute for Neurological Diseases in Gainesville, Florida. She serves as the Tourette Association's Centers of Excellence Coordinator at the Institute. She has a pediatric specialty from the AOCA and has been treating both adults and children with Tourette and Tic Disorders since 2012. Her current focus is on occupational therapy management for Tic Disorders, as well as the use of CBIT to treat tics and improve quality of life. She has participated in multiple small research studies and multiple webinars related to occupational and daily life functioning for those living with Tic Disorders. Amongst many other accomplishments, Dr. Simpson also serves as the, on the TSBTI faculty for CBIT. Thank you both so much for being here, and you may now go ahead with your presentation. Great, thank you so much for having us. Um, we are super excited to be here, and we are super excited that so many of you all have registered to talk, um, join in on this talk today. So thank you for making your time um, to join us. And we are happy to represent uh, the team in talking about this. So. I'm going to go ahead and move forward with our presentation. I do want to recognize that this is not just Dr. Rao and I's talk, that this was a talk designed by um, several of us who have been working on this for many, many months. So this is a multiple minds all together at once. Um, and so here are our names of the team working together with this with Amanda Kaufman, Dr. Keith Kaufman, Dr. Katrina Lindsay, and Wendy Wegman, who I believe all are speaking at the conference this weekend. So thanks to all of the minds who have come together to make this talk possible. And then we have no disclosures other than we are all Centers of Excellence members. So no disclosures. Our objectives for this talk today, um, first off, we wanna make sure that we are disclosing that we are not here to talk about the pharmaceuticals or the medical interventions in regards to managing um, emotional overload in kids with Tourette's, but we are here to talk about the behavioral management of it. Um, we hope that you will gain a better understanding of the mechanisms um, behind uh, emotional overload in children with Tourette's syndrome. We also hope that you will have a better understanding of uh, and be aware of the nature of self-regulation in children with Tourette syndrome, also as well as the guardians and parents in managing emotional overload. And then participants will uh, state strategies to implement before, during, and after emotional overload and specifically during a non-tick event. Um, with a child with Tourette. So stay tuned towards the end of this talk. We'll talk about what happens um, during those moments when it just feels like there's an emotional outburst and you don't know what to do. Um, we have racked our brains to hopefully come up with a strategy for you. So to get started, 
Um, I just want to remind you, I'm sure you've seen this multiple times and hopefully you're well familiar with it, um, that Tourette syndrome is way more than tics itself. And it's really important for this talk to emphasize this, that um, you know, motor and vocal tics are what you see of it right but everything underneath the iceberg is really what is impacting um, those ticks and really often more uh, challenging in particular for this talk rage anxiety sleep difficulties sensory processing depression those things oftentimes contribute to emotional overload and non-tick behaviors in um, children with Tourette's so those are things that are really important for us to understand so what is um, emotional overload? Us as a team, we have determined, we have chose to label uh, non-tick behaviors uh, for the purpose of this talk as emotional overload. And what we have defined it as emotional overload is when an emotional response does not fit the situation um, and your child's ability to use coping strategies is overwhelmed. Essentially, it's how your child's communication is, and it doesn't come out in the appropriate way oftentimes. Um, as Dr. Green said earlier in his talk, it comes out in an inefficient, um, unlucky way. We chose to not label it as a group different as rage attacks. So you will hear rage attacks used um, in literature, but we recognize that emotional overload shows a whole host of emotions versus just rage. Um, so rage attacks is just um, a sudden onset episodic anger um, amount of um, emotions and it tends to come with aggression and we recognize that that part is part of emotional overload, but we felt like it was important to recognize that rage is just one part of emotional overload and it is not the only emotion that kids with Tourette's demonstrate. So emotional overload can include anger, it can include sadness, it can include sensory overload, but it can include positive things such as excitement, such as being so excited that you can't even control it and it leads to so much that you explode over excitement. Um, it can have multiple different types of triggers such as sound sensitivity um, and being able, I can't tell you how many of my kids that I work with get so overloaded by being in places like Sam's Clubs, Costco's or Walmart's, it tends to emotionally overload them immediately. Um, be not, something like not being able to get their choice, not being able to control their excitement when they do something at school, and the options are endless, right? It happens in both positive and negative environments and situations. Research shows that it can occur in up to 70% of children with Tourette syndrome. It can occur in adults too, but it, it oftentimes it's very difficult for children with Tourette syndrome. So it happens a lot, which is why it's an often um, highly sought after complaint in neurological and psychiatric clinics. And we do know that co-occurring conditions such as ADHD and anxiety make this much harder to manage. So if your child has the Tourette triad, um, then it often can be difficult. Now this diagram helps us understand why does this happen. So current research shows that there tends to be a uh, malfunction in the brain circuitry that um, helps us understand why ticks occur. And it's also known as the cortical striatal thalamic cortical circuitry in the brain or known as the C CSTC circuitry. Um, essentially, it's just difficulty in the frontal lobe of the brain, um, the, the planning part of the brain, and then the deep part of the basal ganglia. And the basal ganglia is where we have gatekeepers or filter in our brain saying what movement should be thought through and planned. Um, when someone has Tourette's and has difficulty in the basal ganglia, oftentimes we lose our ability to have a filter or gatekeeper saying what you can or cannot do. So this diagram um, imagined by Dr. Keith Kaufman, it helps us understand kind of what happens when you have a lack of filter in the brain when you have um, a child with Tourette's. So stick with me here. Um, in the top left, we'll start with the movement. So if you have an itch or restlessness in your leg and your brain, if your filter or your gatekeeper isn't working fully, then um, sometimes you, you, your brain doesn't say, hey, it's not necessarily 
necessary for you to jump right now or it's not necessary to shake your head. So go ahead and do whatever you need to do. And that leads to a diagnosis of tics or hyperactivity. Same thing occurs with sensation. So um, if I'm into a busy lunch room and it's really loud and there's lots of smells or I've got a tag in my clothes that's driving me nuts, my brain doesn't say, hey, just ignore it for a little bit, right? It just lets all of those really um, bad annoyances through. And so that leads to sensory processing issues. Or if I have a thought of anxiety, like I have to be perfect if I don't get this right, or if I don't make that letter A perfect, or if I don't um, check that door lock to make sure it's upright because something bad's gonna happen. Um, so I'm gonna think about it all day, right? I'm gonna make sure that I'm doing things just right. And so that lack of filter doesn't say, hey, this isn't the appropriate time for it because we're just watching TV. Um, then that can lead to things like OCD, anxiety, or ADHD. And then similarly, what we're talking about is emotions. Same thing. Let's say your child has a, a day at school where maybe they said something slightly embarrassing to a friend, which happens all the time. And they might think about it and they worry and they're so worried about it. Oh my gosh, is my friend going to think I'm stupid? Or um, maybe I was just so sad because I don't like how my clothes fit today. Or maybe I had a test and I felt like I did really bad on it today and I'm really stressed. Um, and instead of like, being able to separate, okay, I'm not seeing my friend now, or I don't need to come home and worry about that. That That's still building up in me. And so when I come home and my parents ask me, how was my day at school? And I lose it and I explode on them, right? And that's how we have these strong emotions and these explosive behaviors at home. And so this diagram is just helping us understand that with a lack, lack of filter or the basal ganglia, um, that gatekeeper not really processing fully, that it can make it hard for us. And when you have Tourette's, it's especially difficult. So what does emotional overload look like? In a child with Tourette's, it's especially um, difficult because it can wax and wane just like everything else. It can look different in the morning than it does at night. It can look different yesterday than it will tonight. So it, um, it could be crying, it could be screaming, it could be throwing items, it could be hitting myself, it could be hitting others, it could be a sensory overload with like covering ears, curling in, it could be a meltdown of just pure tears and screaming all together, or even it could be a shutdown where just not talking and just pure blank stare, right? So it, it depends on your child, depends on the day and the hour. Um, and before we move forward, I do want to clarify, um, we do want to clarify something. We want to make sure we separate um, out, um, we've already separated out rage attacks, but we also want to separate out intermittent explosive behaviors. Um, intermittent explosive behaviors or intermittent explosive outbursts have been known to occur in about 25 to 50% of patients with Tourette's. Now, this is similarly linked to rage, where it, it's um, a physical attacks, rage attacks seem to go from zero to 100 with aggressive behaviors that are very situ situationally um, out of control and out of context. Intermittent explosive um, disorder is known as a separate condition than Tourette's itself. So um, we want to make sure that that is known that um, just because you have Tourette's does not mean you have um, automatically have intermittent explosive behavior disorder. Um, we do know that intermittent explosive behavior disorder or explosive disorder is more linked with ADHD and that impulsive disorder difficulty with processing, I'm angry, so I'm going to get ang pissed off and throw things or pissed off and, and um, get physically aggressive. Um, there's possibly links to tick severity, but there's no strong evidence on that at this point. Um, and researchers still don't have a clear scientific explanation as to why intermittent explosive behaviors and outbursts occur in some people with ticks um, versus others. So um, going forward, uh, we wanna make sure we are talking about, um, for the rest of this presentation, we are clearly emphasizing intermittent um, explosive behaviors is, is recognized as part of an emotional overload itself. So Jan, I'm gonna pass it on to you. Thank you, Heather, and hello, everyone. Um, so let's talk a little bit about what 
commonly seen problems are in different um, environments. In the home, this um, emotional overload can look one way, um, especially when you're asking your child to transition from one activity to another, um, one part of the day to another, um, or even um, transitions with regard to different people being in the home. Um, oftentimes you'll see the um, emotional overload kinds of symptoms when you're asking the child to do the unpreferred task, maybe chores or homework, um, things that are not high on their, their list of things to, to get done. Um, but you can also see it in the home environment with regard to sibling relations um, or other people in the home. If there are, are um, dyads that um, problems exist between dyads, then you may see um, these behaviors present during those times as well. In the school environment, it can look different. Um, some of you would probably report that school absolutely has no problem with your child, that they kind of look at you like you have two heads um, when, when you talk about the things that happen at home because they never see it at school. Um, now, is it actually happening at school and they just don't notice it? That's possible. But it's also possible that your child is reacting and um, uh, positively responding to the kind of structure that's in place at school and the consistent expectations. Those kinds of things are very hard to replicate in a home environment. So your child may do fairly well in the school. Then again, with excitement or um, stress of a test like Heather was talking about, um, or um, you know, difficulty with, with a, um, a peer, um, those kinds of things can bring out these behaviors that we're referring to in the school system. Um, Again, transitions possibly, you know, before PE, um, during recess, after PE, um, changing classes in the hall. Um, those are maybe the times that if someone was watching them, if an adult was watching them, you know, constantly in the school environment, they might see it during those times of transition or in a particular class that they have difficulty with or just really don't like. With regard to peers, there can be difficulty following rules. Um, maybe your child is the one that is always um, calling out the cheater um, or, or feeling um, persecuted in some way, um, that people are ganging up on them, they're not following the rules, they're not letting them win. Um, those kinds of things may be um, familiar statements from your child. Um, they also have difficulty reading social cues. So your child may, um, you know, be very literal in the sense that um, what is what is said to him or her or the kinds of um, behaviors from another peer. They may not be able to read that well and get confused by it, um, misinterpret, and then have these emotional um, outbursts as well. In public, um, public can be one of the more challenging uh, context simply because there's such a, uh, a high um, consequence associated with it. Um, when you're out in public with your child, you're, you're hoping that they, you know, respond to things um, well. You're hoping that uh, your child and or you don't wind up being embarrassed by their behavior um, and that you're not being sucked into their behavior and reacting in a way that is um, um, unflattering to you as well. So, uh, you know, things like fatigue, hunger, um, the child not understanding the, the sort of the full agenda of what is going to happen while they're out in, in these public areas. Um, you know, you said we were only going to the grocery store and now we're picking up laundry and also stopping to, you know, get the dog food. Um, but you said we were only going to get groceries. Um, so that lack of flexibility was with scheduling um, and with also different stops along the way. You might see crying and tantrums. Um, the child might also engage in inappropriate um, conversation. Um, and in a little bit, you'll, you'll see from the case study that I'm gonna present, um, there's also some inappropriate touching that, that can happen as well. Okay, so let's go to the case. All right, so I want you to meet W.S. He's a 10 and a half year old biracial male. Um, his medical history includes uh, tics, ADHD, ODD, and ASD. 
um, autism spectrum disorder. And this is not um, an uncommon combination of diagnoses for Dr. Simpson and I to see in, in our clinics, um, especially when we're talking about these emotional overloads and outburst. Um, this individual patient was actually diagnosed just two months ago with TS, even though he's 10 and a half. Um, you can see from that laundry list of, of diagnoses that there was probably a lot of confusion and um, not necessarily uh, clear cut paths along the way of, of what might have been ticks and what might have been um, seen as uh, possibly stereotypical behaviors um, associated with his ASD diagnosis. Um, or even the ODD. Um, he, uh, his mother is a single mom. There are no siblings. He has had good support of a psychologist for the past five years um, who's been working with him um, and mom with regard to the behavioral issues, um, both at home and school, and also with regard to his ASD diagnosis. He started CBIT five weeks ago, and some of the things that he really enjoys are drawing, coloring, playing with the family cat, he loves to listen to various YouTube videos, and he also enjoys cutting and styling um, his doll's hair. Um, so he has um, about four or five dolls um, that he um, enjoys doing their hair. And then once he's cut it all off or um, styled it to a, into a style that can't be undone, then it's time to move on to the next one. All right, next slide. And Dr. Simpson is going to talk about emotional self-regulation. Thanks. And we're going to we're going to follow WS throughout this talk. So we're as we're going to move forward, you're going to see how he progresses and what we're um, how we would take him through um, a treatment. So um, bear with us as we move forward on this. Um, so let's talk about the, the first step of emotional overload and emotional self-regulation. So what is self-regulation? That, that's a good first question. So self-regulation is a skill um, that allows uh, an individual to manage our emotions, behaviors, movements appropriately to the situation wherever we are um, and no matter what situation we're in. Um, it is an important not only for emotional control, but it's also important for um, attention um, and uh, being able to pay attention in, in class. So it's not only um, important just for emotions. So that's why we didn't call it an emotional regulation. We're calling it self-regulation. It is different from self-control because self-control involves a little bit more of a social skill. So it involves knowing um, the contextual and the social situation for it. But what it is, this is not an easy task. So it's it it sometimes can come naturally for some, but it's what we call a top-down control task. It is very, very difficult. We start learning this task at an early age and um, as an early child, um, but we learn this all the way through adulthood. So it's not something that we are you know, at age two, it's something we know how to do, or at age five, it's not something that we just naturally say, hey, by the time you're in third grade, you should know how to self-regulate. That's not how this works. It requires a lot of work um, as a young child all the way up to adulthood and, and knowing how to do. Um, it re requires, as I said, a top-down control. It requires awareness from an individual um, to be able to recognize what we're feeling and be able to change it. This is what we call metacognition. So being able to pay attention, how am I feeling, what's going on, and then be able to regulate outwardly. So an inward to an outward emotion. Um, this also involves the autonomic nervous system, um, being able to tell what is my body feeling? Is Am I this fight or flight? So is this my increased heart rate? Is my nausea? Um, is that normal? Is it not normal? Should I do something about it? Should I panic? Or should I go into a calming um, regulation time period? Um, it requires extensive training. Um, and it, again, it's not something that you're innately um, able to do. Um, but also there are a lot of factors that influence self-regulation. So my ability to self-regulate is very different than your child's or uh, my coworkers. So um, you know, disease, personality, uh, genetics, 
cultural beliefs, um, environmental beliefs, societal beliefs, even health professionals. So a pediatric um, a pediatrician's beliefs versus a psychologist's beliefs maybe is very different. Um, if someone has a history of trauma, that can impact the ability to self-regulate um, and train. So there's a lot of factors that go into self-regulation. Now, um, what does that mean for a child with Tourette's? So what we know, because there's so many factors that go into this, that with a child with Tourette's, the co-occurring conditions tend to make regulation much more difficult. As Dr. Rao mentioned, ADHD, anxiety, autism, ASD makes it a lot more difficult to manage. We do know that this lack of filter that we talked about, that ability of the basal ganglia to say, hey, no, that, that emotion's not needed right now, or that thought's not needed right now, makes it more challenging to, to regulate and say, hey, I don't need to panic, or I don't need to feel overwhelmed because I can think about that another time. Um, situational components make it worse. So um, we know that kids with Tourette's um, tend to, to struggle in stressful situations or sensory overloaded situations that not only makes tics more challenging, but it can make self-regulation more challenging. Um, and then we also know that children with Tourette's, because of that pathway, the cortical striatal foul milk cortical, <laughs> I'll get there, CSTC circuitry um, shows difficulty because of the pathway in the brain. Um, they have difficulty with inhibitory control. So being able to say, nope, not needed. Maybe some higher level reasoning, um, planning, and even problem solving. And all of these go with Dr. Ross Green's talking about, those are on that list that he described about um, what, are, what are some areas or problem areas that your child has difficulty with in order um, for problem solving, right? So this is, these are all, not diagnoses, but things, problem areas that we can work on. And I do love this image of the developmental iceberg um, that uh, Dr. Mona Delahook uses, or showed on her Instagram. And it talks about the behavioral challenges iceberg, and on the top, um, you see behavioral issues, right? So it might be that your child's screaming or not doing something, but everything underneath the iceberg is actually what's happening. So those are the emotions. It's the difficulty with thought processes, the problem solving, um, movement challenges. And so that there's a lot more that goes underneath the iceberg um, that we have to figure out. And again, this goes along with Dr. Ross Green's that it's a, it's a problem solving, it's a proactive, process to regulate and it's not a reactive process. Now, something that we oftentimes forget and neglect to think about is the self-regulation of you as a parent of a child with Tourette's. You have your own emotion or your own iceberg of emotion, right? Um, and that we know that your emotions regulate your child's emotions, whether we like to think it or not. And it's totally fair that you are allowed to be stressed. So if your child is having these emotional overloads all the time and like you feel like you're walking on eggshells, you're probably filled to the top of um, stress and anxiety all the time. So no wonder why your child's feeling that way too. And, and it's hard to, to be able to regulate when both of you are feeling like you're walking on eggshells, right? Um, and so it's really important that um, when we are talking about self-regulation and emotional overload in kids with Tourette's, that we also recognize that a part of that process is parents making sure that they're regulating their own emotions um, and that you're not only su not suppressing your emotions um, because that ends up exploding emotions. Um, we have kids, especially with Tourette's, who tend to suppress their emotions and then explode out of nowhere. Um, but learning from you that it's okay to feel emotions in a healthy way. Um, and that we as parents or healthcare providers, we can teach them how to regulate their emotions by modeling behaviors. So if I'm working with a kid and I'm having a stressful day, it's okay for me to say, hey, you know, today's been a little bit of a rough day. Um, how about how about we do something to to have you had a rough day? How about we do something to to see if we can regulate ourselves before we get started for for CBIT today? Um, and and maybe that would be something that we can do. But modeling behaviors is a is a great um, 
important step of this. And again, just echoing what all research says, including Dr. Ross Green's talk this morning, um, it, it's all about collaborative problem solving. We can't just do this for your kids, but we have to have them involved. So we have to teach regulation and self-regulation. Dr. Mona Delahook, I love this quote. She said, many children simply lack the neurodevelopmental foundation upon which successful self-regulation is built. Asking them to self-regulate is like expecting a teenager to drive a car without any training classes. We would never expect a teenager to get behind a car with something so dangerous, right, without teaching them. But emotions can be equally as dangerous. We can't expect our kids to know how to process or manage dangerous emotions, anger, depression, you know, excitement, without teaching them how to manage those. It is very, very important for later life success. Starting early, age two, age three, we're teaching them how to regulate. Um, we just do it a little bit differently as young kids, but teaching them how to regulate is very important for later life success. And we do know that therapy is highly effective, um, whether it's through modeling or behavioral therapy. I wanted to show you a few examples of what we um, have done in, in occupational therapy, but also in other therapy programs. Um, the first step of this is teaching your child how to even recognize emotions, especially with kids with Tourette's. Sometimes it's just hard for them to realize what they're feeling because they might feel like they go from zero to 100 because that's what they feel. And that in-between area just feels really gray. And so teaching them to recognize that in-between is very important. So on the right is um, an example from the Zones of Regulation program. It's a program that teaches self-regulation and talks about um, the color. They use colors to describe how they're feeling, blue being sad, kind of tired, kind of puny, green being the perfect learning, happy, great time period, yellow being kind of frustrated, worried, kind of, or excited, and red being in the anger phase. And so a parent can say, hey, what, where are you at right now? And they might say, I'm in yellow, or I'm in, or I'm in blue, and then you do something to change it. And then on the left is something that I use from the CPRI program, which I'll tell you about later, but it's a beaker program. Um, and this was from a kid who really struggled with using language to talk about how he felt. And so instead of being able to um, say how he felt, all he did was point to a color or a number and he was able to tell his um, mother how he was feeling. So she would ask him every day when she picked him up from school, where's your beaker? And he would say a six or an eight. And if he was at a six, then she wouldn't force homework initially. She would give him about 15, 20 minutes of um, quiet time to kind of calm. And then, then they would go right into homework um, instead of starting right there. But if he had a really good day and it was four, maybe they would start with homework. Um, and so recognizing emotions is very important. So I'm going to pass it off to Dr. Rao to talk about our case. Thank you, Dr. Simpson. Okay, so let's continue with W.S. He and his mom reside in a single family home, um, but they do have close neighbors. And in the past, um, the mom has been very conscious of who might be hearing um, some of the outbursts that W.S. has through the, the afternoon, usually occurring after school um, into the early evening. So that's been a, a source of stress for her in the past. Um, due to COVID, um, he and mom have basically been homebound for a year with the one exception that he did start back to in-person school in January of this year. Um, mom has her own health issues which place her at high risk for COVID um, at least until she got her vaccines but um, she does have um, chronic fatigue and some respiratory issues. Um, school and the um, psychologist that he has been seeing, the private psychologist, have used the zones of regulation that Dr. Simpson was just talking about um, with WS over the past three years. They, they have seen some improvement with that. Um, his, his behavior at school has probably improved the most, um, but in the home and out in the community, it has continued to be um, problematic. Um, W.S.'s mom has utilized a, a phrase that, that she coined, time between us, as um, a, kind of a signal for them to have breaks in the home from each other. And this can either be cooling off periods if, if one or the other is, is really upset with one another um, or the other, 
and also when she needs a break due to her um, her own health issues. Um, most of the time that that phrase time between us works, um, but there are times that WS um, rebels and um, does not honor that particular signal from mom and continues to try to engage her even though she really needs um, some time alone. Um, they both report that 12 of their 15 wakeful hours with each other um, are just fine but it's those three hours a day like I said usually after school and early evening that tend to be the biggest problem areas for them. And you wouldn't necessarily think that three hours in, a, in an entire day is that big of a deal, but I'm sure there are many of you in the audience right now thinking to yourself, even 30 minutes of challenging behavior is a big deal, much less three hours, and especially if it's consecutive hours. Okay, let's, now we wanna talk a little bit about what kind of pulls this all together, um, the family systems theory. Um, and some of the basic tenets here, um, you'll see the the, the baby mobile there off to the right of the screen, um, which is I think a great visual because it both ties together the, the various members um, as, as a family unit, but also allows you to see that everybody's individuals. Um, and while each person is interconnected with the other, everybody's also unique. So what one person does affects the family and what the family does affects each individual person. Um, it's important to remember that everyone in the family has a different viewpoint. And when we when we talk about families, um, especially nowadays, we're talking about really any significant person who spends um, uh, consistent amounts of time in the home with with each person. So if it maybe is a, a nanny or um, an au pair or the, um, <clears throat> the housekeeper who also, you know, helps to stay in the evenings to start a meal. Um, maybe it is the um, ABA teacher who comes to the house several hours a week. Um, you really need to think about each person that is um, spending uh, fair amounts of time in the home with the family and how their contributions can um, play a part in this. There are also subsystems that exist, you know, the parent-child dyad, um, the spouses, um, the siblings, and maybe there's an extended family member that's in the home, a grandparent or both grandparents. Um, families in general are trying to maintain equilibrium. They're trying to keep things balanced, um, both in the home as well as out of the home. And that can be a challenge um, a, a good part of the time, just because of things that happen. Um, and no day is ever like another, right? So, you know, um, even though you have schedules and calendars and, and you shoot for consistency, that, that doesn't mean that you're gonna get that every time. Um, and when it does happen and you've get, had a really good day, those are the days that you tend to remember, not the, <laughs> um, not the ones that, you know, go smoothly. So um, resources are, are needed for adaptation and change. Um, it oftentimes means that um, people have to come together and decide what is going to change and how we're going to make that change. We also need to hold each other accountable, but in a positive way. Nobody wants to hear all of the bad things that they're doing. Um, you know, and when we're talking about our kids that have difficulties regulating their behavior and their emotions, um, it's very easy to get stuck on telling them all the things that they do wrong. Um, we need to flip that coin and start with all of the things that they are doing right and that the effort that they are putting into it. Um, because even though it may not look like it, if you're seeing one good thing a day out of your child, it's probably taking them a lot of effort to make that happen. So, you know, it's just like we, we tell our families when we are, we're doing CBIT with them. It's not about, um, you know, did your child, you know, minimize a tick? That's, that's not how we necessarily measure success. It's the effort that they're putting into using their strategies because that effort will pay off and they will be able to minimize and manage their ticks using CBIT. But it, it's just a different frame of thought and the, and the same is uh, applied here. We want to start with, congratulating the child and recognizing the child for the things that they're doing right and the effort that they're putting into it. Okay. So 
let's talk about managing those challenging behaviors. Um, Dr. Simpson, when she first started talking about this um, presentation, she, in the objective, she um, alluded to the fact that we would be uh, taking you through all of the steps of this emotional overload and um, the irregulation of uh, emotions. And so one of the first most important steps is looking at prevention. We want to try to be proactive and not reactive. And in order to do that, we need to first recognize and identify what warning signs are. Now, you may or may not already know what your child's warning signs are, when they're going to kind of lose it. Um, what we want to try to do is catch all of that before it happens. And you may be very well, well aware of what their warning signs are, but the child might not have a clue. So we want everybody to have the same kind of recognition of what those um, early and imminent warning signs are. This is kind of a puzzle. Um, as Dr. Green and others have talked about, we, we're trying to problem solve here. So we're trying to find the what is it and when does it happen? There may be, um, we, we wanna be mindful of, of triggers and how to manage but you also don't want to avoid triggers. So just because you know that, um, you know, taking your child into a public space is likely going to result in some kind of an emotional um, breakdown, you don't necessarily want to stay away from those public spaces because then you're just, you're, you're not addressing the problem. Um, now, without strategies in place and a, a plan, then we don't advise just continuing to to do the same thing that you've been doing but as you start to put all of these pieces together that we're going to continue to talk about here um, you'll you'll want to um, include the places where you know the triggers are most often going to result in um, the the um, unwanted behaviors have a plan um, and you, you're going to want to know what to do and when to do it um, you're also want to include all the stakeholders, um, but when they're in the mindset to do so. So if it's, you know, two parents in a home, um, three children, and maybe a grandparent, all of those people need to come together to have this discussion, but we don't need to do it when somebody has um, something major going on um, that day or maybe the next day. Um, they can't really focus on what you're you're asking them to, to focus on and contribute to. We want everybody to be engaged in this process. So, you know, timing is, is really important in, um, for this particular uh, process. Um, and then also, as Dr. Simpson er, uh, mentioned earlier, you probably all know that feeling of walking on eggshells and going out of your way to avoid conflict. If that's the case, then you know, you've know you come to the right session because change is needed. And we hope that by the end of this today, you'll have some go-to uh, plan for yourself and for your family that you can begin to um, make these positive changes. Okay, so one of the first steps that we talk about is having a family meeting. Um, the purpose is to recognize that everybody's opinion makes a difference. We want to hear from everybody. Um, we are all in this together. That's not just a saying, but you're, you really are. You're a family, you're a unit. Um, and yes, you all are individuals, but you all contribute to the same um, set of, of rules and uh, circumstances. And so we, we want everybody to be um, involved. And then there's this positive accountability, which is you know making sure that everybody understands their worth, their value, um, and also knowing that they have a say in this. The goal is to work together to make decisions as a family and everyone has a stake in those decisions. So if your child, for instance, is not wanting to be part of this, um, they, they need to understand how it's going to benefit them. That you know this isn't an arm twisting kind of thing, that there, there's a goodie in this for all, for everyone. Um, and that probably everyone has work to do, not probably, I'm sure that everybody in the family unit has work to do in this process. Um, even people who don't tend to have um, difficult 
difficulty with their emotions or their behavior, maybe um, another sibling who um, is kind of your perfect child that you know never gets in trouble, never causes trouble, um, that person still is going to have work to do in this process as we go forward. Um, the general rules for the family meetings, everyone gets a chance to talk, one person talks at a time, so there's no interrupting. Um, everyone has to listen, but not everyone has to talk. And then no one puts anyone else down. And you parents um, out there in the audience know how that can look. It doesn't have to be you know, a verbal statement to put someone down. It can be an eye roll. It can be turning you know, your body away from whoever's talking, um, you know, just sort of dissing that person. We, we don't want that kind of behavior. So we wanna establish these um, ground rules in the beginning and everybody agrees to it up front. A lot of families have chosen to you know, put these rules on a poster board and they, they post them on you know, a wall or put them in front of a chair when everybody is sitting around um, the table or you know, sitting on the floor together or whatever, um, wherever you feel like your family kind of comes together as a, as a unit um, nicely. Um, have these rules available and visible so that everybody knows what they're dealing with and what they're being asked to respect. Um, you're gonna be making plans to implement a solution and you're also going to come up with alternate um, situations. So for instance, when your child um, is having an outburst and if they won't leave that space where the rest of the family is um, that has been agreed on earlier, they won't leave the space and go to the already identified space, then everybody else goes someplace else. Or if it's just you and your child, like in the case of WS, then mom would go to an alternate um, space and leave WS in that particular location. Now, I'm not talking about down the street or um, you know, getting in your car and driving to Texas and you're in Kansas, although sometimes you may feel like you wanna do that. Um, we're just talking about into a different room or maybe outside on the deck. Um, but those kinds of things need to be planned ahead of time so that um, if your child has other issues, um, anxiety, separation anxiety, those kinds of things. We're not escalating that um, by moving into a different space. They know that you're still there. They know you're just in a different room. Everything is still safe. They're safe. Um, you're just not going to be entertaining their behavior. And then also at the end of the family meeting, plan one fun activity for the upcoming week. This needs to be a time where families really come together and start communicating, not just about the problems in the family, but also about things that they want to achieve as a family. So, you know, maybe it's, hey, we've talked for a long time about going to a drive-in movie theater. You know, I found one and it's 30 minutes from our home. Why don't we try to do that, you know, next weekend or summer break is coming up. So maybe one night during the week. Um, those are the kinds of things that the, the family meeting can end on. So you're ending on a positive note. It's giving everybody something to look forward to um, and may even be a carrot to, you know, hold out there for people to um, uh, commit to. Um, not that you're going to take it away if, if something goes wrong, um, but it can be something, you know, fun that the family looks forward to and gives everybody an incentive to work on this problem together. Okay. In the moment, so we've talked about the preventative, like beforehand, and then the family meeting, which establishes the rules, the ground rules, and what to expect. And then in the moment is where you want to just make sure that everyone is safe. You want to make sure that, that breakables are out of the reach of child or just put away. Um, you or the child need to leave the room. Um, but you also want to watch for the warning signs. So uh, if you start to see your child um, disintegrating, you start to see those things um, that you know are triggers that, you know, in the next five minutes, you're going to have some explosive behavior or, or meltdown um, or just a, you know, kind of a shutdown. Try to act before the moment happens. Do not try to intervene in the moment. Your child cannot process what you're asking them to do in the moment. They're already too far gone at that point. And I, I don't mean, you know, too far gone, you know, they're 
an alien or something, but they, they can't, their brains cannot process what you're saying. They can't process what you're asking them to do. Um, probably not even, you know, uh, visual uh, signals at that point. So in the moment, if your child hasn't responded ahead of time to leave the room, go to another place and then begin doing activities to help calm themselves, this may be the point where you then need to leave the room um, or other parts or other people in the family need to, to leave the room, leaving the child or the person having the meltdown um, alone, but you know they're safe. Um, there's not going to be any harm that comes to them or hopefully to an animal, a pet or something like that. Um, you want to also stop. This does not help if you're reacting in the same way. If you're yelling, if you're giving commands in a very uh, gruff voice, if um, you know one parent is maybe not on board with this um, and you're trying, you as the parent who's on board with the plan um, and the other parent is kind of mediocre about this, and the the mediocre parent is now, you know, is, is just pushed him or her to their to their last um, you know, sort of shred of, of patience, then it's it would be easy to get caught up in the moment and become just as emotional as the child, just in different ways. Um, you know, it manifests maybe differently in, in the adult. Um, giving your child a cue or signal to go to the predetermined space is, is a good thing, but again, you wanna try to do that before the meltdown starts um, and allowing your child to get to that safe location. Um, so, you know, you, you're trying to give those commands early and sometimes it's good to give both a verbal but also some kind of visual cue, which we'll talk about in, the, in just a minute, um, and then allow them the time to move to that position. Um, there may be a little bit of rebellion. Um, they're, they're going, but they're not maybe moving as fast as you want them to. Don't engage in that. Don't get into that challenging piece. You know, they're not moving fast enough. I, you know, I told you, you need to go to your room or to go to wherever, you know, that pre-identified space is. If they're moving in that direction, give them the time to do it. Um, if you don't engage with them, the likelihood of them actually following through is, is very strong. Um, if they won't go to that particular place, then again, you go elsewhere. Um, and, but once, they get there or you leave the room, then you're, you're hoping um, and you're coaching ahead of time is um, to get them to use those predetermined calming strategies. And we'll talk about a few of those in just a minute with the, the um, continuation of the case of WS. Um, visual aids are really helpful because again, depending on how your child is processing information, um, you know, relying on just one form of um, information is not always a good thing. So you want to try to do a visual, you want to try to do a verbal, you might even try some kind of tactile cue where you guys have agreed ahead of time that if you walk up to your child and, um, you know, put your hand on their shoulder, sort of nudging them, in, you know, in a, in a direction, um, at the same time that maybe you're giving them a hand signal, uh, you know, thumbs up, or um, maybe you've got a, a poster board that you point to, um, you know, the identified space or something, and then also saying um, it's time for you to, to go to your space. All three of those multi-systems um, have a better chance of, of processing with your child, depending on where they are emotionally. Okay. So a calming space might look something like this. Um, it doesn't have to, but it might be something that's very soothing to your child. It does need to be uncluttered. Um, it needs to be a special place. It needs to be a place that they really want to go. They don't need to see this as punishment. Um, they also don't need to see it as, as something, you know, that they're really dreading. Um, so it doesn't need to be, especially, you know, if they're afraid of a basement or if they're afraid of a particular part of the house, that doesn't need to be their calming space because it's not going to be calming to them. Um, and it doesn't matter why they're not comfortable in that space. I mean, that that's, could be maybe something that you all decide and figure out during a family meeting, but um, until that <clears throat> until that is figured out and, and dealt with, they need to, to be allowed to go someplace that they feel calm, that they feel safe, um, that it feels um, you know nice to them and cozy. Um, 
And they also need to have a few items that they can have in that particular space that are only used in that space. So if, for instance, um, they have Legos or they have um, a particular doll that they like, or maybe they um, have um, some fidgets that they use um, or listen to music or something. Those kinds of things need to be available in that space, but not available just anytime, anywhere, because it takes away the, the meaning of what it's for. And it also, um, the novelty of using it wears off as well. So this is an example of a virtual um, calming room, but um, there, again, it doesn't have to look like this and, and you as a family can, can make that space look um, and feel um, the way that it needs to for your, for your child. Okay. All right. And then this is maybe the, I don't know, some I guess would, would argue that maybe this is the most important piece of this process, but it certainly it has a very high priority. Um, the after. What happens after the incident? Um, you need to have a debrief, and this is just as important as that family meeting. So everybody, again, comes together. Um, there needs to be some acknowledgement for the child um, and their efforts, um, whether uh, regardless of the amount of success. But you need to start off with praising and acknowledging the child for the things that they did do right. Um, and then also be specific about that. So, you know, not just um, good job using your strategies. I mean, talk specifically about what you saw them doing and the effort that you saw going into this. You're going to have time during this to also talk about the things that still need to be improved upon, but it, it's important for your child to understand what they got right in that moment. And especially if it was before the full meltdown, um, you want to be specific about that and then discuss the action that can be further strengthened. But that needs to be from everybody. So again, everybody has work to do here. So, you know, maybe that sibling that, that doesn't cause any trouble, that's always supportive, um, that person still can offer something in this process. And maybe it's that that person is the best person to offer the cue to the sibling to go to another, another space. Maybe, you know, the child rebels every time the parent tries to get them to go to the other space, but they do really well with that one sibling that can can talk to them and maybe calm them and um, doesn't get emotionally charged by their behaviors. Um, and maybe that's the person that needs to go and tell them that um, they need to move to another space. Remember, it's not personal and everybody needs to work together. We're figuring out the why. So again, this is a big problem solving activity. Okay. Okay, so this is WS. Um, they had a family meeting. They agreed to these rules, no interrupting. One person talks at a time. If you disagree with something, you will get a chance to say that. Each person has to say something positive about the other before saying something negative. The results of that meeting were that WS and mom were able to identify three things about themselves that made them unique and special. Um, and they actually genuinely came up with some things that they hadn't talked about before with each other. They agreed they wanted all of their time together to be enjoyable. So those three hours, those three wakeful hours that weren't that, that really could be challenging for them, they agreed that they wanted that to also be nice. And then they agreed to use their learn tools and respect each other. Um, respect each other's needs. Um, they also agree to each go to their chosen detour spots. And I use detour because we actually use the leaky brakes um, system um, with, with WS and his mom. And that's a, a term out of that particular uh, protocol. So in their um, meeting, we were also able to come up with the most consistent triggers for meltdowns. For WS, it was hunger, which was mostly observed by his irritability, um, his fatigue or tiredness, which was observed with him not agreeing to anything, even the things that he really loved, boredom, um, which translated to argumentative, restless, inappropriate giggling, and then also in public, his observa the observed behaviors were inappropriate touching of mom, demeaning comments of mom, and then just yelling, which you can imagine could be just horribly embarrassing. For mom, um, because of her health conditions, her triggers were pain, which oftentimes was observed as being curt, 
you know, giving brief answers, um, loss of patience, her fatigue, which was sitting on the couch for long periods of time or lying down, um, and then also headaches were a trigger for her, which um, were observed mostly by her having her eyes closed and hands on forehead. Okay, and this is just an overview of the last five weeks using the leaky break system um, with WS and his mom. And it started off slowly and it did not go without problems, that's for sure. Um, as you can see in the first week, uh, WS refused all but one of uh, 12 cues that mom provided. Um, by week three, he was taking um, a detour once a day independently and was um, compliant with taking due tours when cued by teacher or mom. Um, and in this last week, um, WS was detoured on average of three times a day independently. Also had added two more activities to his detour list um, and he now calls it fixing his breaks. So he's come a long way and has had chosen to be much more independent about this. A lot of the whininess and irritability has subsided. Not that they still don't have problems, they certainly do, and we still have work to do, but he's he's definitely made a lot of progress and he's been able to see that as well as mom. Mom also um, has made a lot of progress. In the first week, she was using detours to lie down and have quiet time every time that WS uh, was misbehaving because she just was full. She just didn't have any other resources and she needed to just get away. Um, by week three, she was taking due tours together with, um, with WS. Um, and um, by, again, last week, um, mom was detouring less now because she, um, be less now because of his behavior. Um, and she's feeling more relaxed around WS and doesn't, she actually is feeling physically better. So the program is working for them. Um, again, it's not without hiccups, um, but each week we address what those hiccups are and they're, they're very committed to moving forward. Okay, and Dr. Simpson is gonna finish this up by talking about some resources. Thanks, Dr. Rout. So real quickly, we'll just go through this. Um, point is, it takes work. This isn't something that's going to be a magic pill that um, that we could just give to you and it's going to be better. It is, as Dr. Green mentioned, as Dr. Rao showed in her case example, this takes work. Um, it takes training. It takes practice. So how do you get to it? Um, talk If you haven't started a program like this with you or your family, talk to a physician to seek a referral for a behavioral intervention um, to either a psychologist, a neuropsychologist, an occupational therapist, or an ABA specialist. Um, each one of those do one of these programs, and we all do it. We just do it differently, um, and all of them do it well. So um, all of those can do um, self-regulation training. Um, and if your child is in school and has a 504 plan or an IEP, work with the school to establish a positive behavioral support plan because these things um, working, especially if you have um, some of these emotional overloads or these emotional outbursts at school, um, they can help with uh, helping the prevention in the moment and understanding afterwards how to, to make these so that they're not as interfering at school um, and making sure that these don't happen consistently at school with a positive behavioral support plan. And the TRED Association has many great resources for that. Um, and then we will provide you, we've provided you here with um, two common programs, the zones of regulation, which we've talked about, and the alert program are both very similar programs, just using different terms that talk about self-regulation, um, using terminology on talking about how to recognize how you're feeling and how to change your emotional regulation and your sensory regulation. And then the one that Dr. Rao mentioned here um, is called the CPRI Leaky Breaks Program. It's free out of Canada um, and it is actually designed for Tourette syndrome. And so that's why we use it a lot in our clinics. Um, it is, it has free videos, free handouts. The psychologist gets online and talks about you have Tourette's and we all have leaky breaks and how our emotions or our frustration are, we have a beaker full of emotions and sometimes it fills and overloads. Um, and your OCD, your tics can fill your beaker and how do you release it? Um, if you as a family aren't comfortable doing that, then it's easy for your providers to find those resources and learn how to use them. Um, but it's a very easy program to use. 
And then following up with Dr. Green's talk this morning, um, his Lives and Balance website has all those free resources and blogs. It has the assessment of lagging skills and unsolved problems that helps you talk about um, difficulty with problem solving, whether it's maintaining focus and helping understand why certain behaviors are happening. Um, and his book, The Explosive Child, is a great resource for uh, understanding the uh, easily frustrated and flexible children. And then the Dr. Mona Della Hook's book, Beyond Behaviors, and her um, Instagram, she also, she's the one with the um, developmental iceberg, so she helps you understand why behavioral challenges are more than just behavioral challenges, that they tend to be an iceberg of things. And then lastly, there are a lot of free resources out there. Here are just some really popular ones that in the moment, if you need it preventatively um, and your kids are glued to their iPhones, there are some, a lot of really great calming apps and websites that can be used. Um, and here are all the resources here. So you will have access to this on the recording and um, post chat afterwards. So thank you all for listening and we are here for your questions. So I will open it back up to you, Angela. Great, thank you so much for such a great presentation. Lots of great information in there. Um, and as Heather said, we're now going to be answering the questions that were submitted during the presentation. As a reminder, you can still submit questions in the questions pane on the control panel. If we're unable to get to everyone's questions, which we probably won't because there are quite a few, um, and we have, we're gonna go for about 15 minutes, but we will be collecting all the questions and I'll be sending them off to the speakers and we will get those questions answered for you. Um, you can also give the TAA a call, 1-888-4-TOURETTE, or email support at tourette.org, and we'd be more than happy to answer those questions. Okay, so the first question I have for you both is, are the emotional overload episodes in kids with TS clinically or functionally different from similar overload in ASD, which is often called autistic meltdown? Oh, go ahead. Okay. <laughs> um, having worked with both both populations, I would say that um, they look, can look very, very similar. Um, I don't know clinically that they are any different, um, but uh, functionally they um, can look very similar, um, and there there may be different triggers um, for this uh, for the particular episodes. But what you actually see is going to be very similar. Um, and I, but I would say that this process works equally well um, with both uh, populations. Um, again, depending on you know your child's um, level of understanding, uh, ability to communicate, all of those kinds of things, um, which can be different with ASD. I completely agree. I just think the mechanism's a little bit different. Um, so absolutely. Great. Thank you. Next question, is emotional overload always accompanied by a display of intense emotions? For example, my six-year-old will hit, throw things, but appear very calm. So emotion, it doesn't, um, we talk about stuff, we call it emotional overload, but think about self-regulation. The definition of that was movements, emotions, and um, actions. So although em emotions was just one part of self-regulation. So we used emotional overload as a generalized term, um, but it does not have to be emotions, right? So the emotional overload could be, um, it presents differently for each person. It could just be the hitting things. It could be, um, could be throwing things, it could be hitting self, it could be just a shutdown. So it might not show any emotions except a blank wall. Um, it, there's just not a really good term to describe the change in, um, in presence, the change in regulation essentially is what it is. And I will say that when you don't have, with, in the absence of emotion, I think that's when also it becomes very confusing to both parents um, and teachers and, and other adults um, because it looks very defiant. It looks very willful. Um, so in the absence of emotion, it's hard sometimes for parents to understand that this is this is something they, they are not controlling necessarily. Great, thank you. Okay, next question. 
how do you know the difference between rage attacks and intermittent explosive behavior? I don't, oh, go ahead. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. I don't think there's a clear definition. I think that's still being figured out. We've had several conversations on that. And I think, I think rage attacks are, um, I, how about this? I should start by saying I am not a diagnostician, so I'm not the <laughs> correct person to answer this. So I should first put my correct hat on. Um, but I don't think there is a clear, um, clear definition on that. And that's still being, um, sought after, but there are several good people and Dr. Um, Kathy Budman, um, and Carol Matthews do several great talks on rage attacks and trying to help understand um, the differences between intermittent explosive disorder and rage attacks. Um, but I, um, I think there's a lot of confusion on that. Right. And, and clinically, they're, they're really the same. We're treating symptoms and one's just a diagnosis. Great, thanks. Okay, you guys might like this question. Do you usually recommend OT as part of the treatment team for kids diagnosed with Tourette syndrome? We're waiting for further testing to rule out ADHD, ADHD, GAD, ASD, ODD, and learning to the diagnosis with psychologists as my 11-year-old daughter was diagnosed with TS a few weeks ago by her primary care. We're at the start of assessments, for treatment, looking to expedite treatment due to severity of neck thrusting tics on cervical damage and complex verbal tics on social interactions. Yeah, so the question, I think the, the basic question was, do we tend to um, uh, recommend OT assessments and, and OT involvement yeah. in, in yeah. these cases? <laughs> and the answer from both of us is absolutely. Um, what we also recognize is not all OTs um, have worked with this population um, and necessarily know where to start. So I know because Heather and I do these things all the, all the time together and independently, but we always recommend um, for each other as well as with each other that if your OT needs assistance, we are always happy and willing to talk to a school OT or a private OT and help them chart the path for your child, um, you are welcome to give them our contact information and we will do everything we can to help get them in the right direction. If, if this is not an area of expertise for them or, or they don't really know where to start, um, you know, set aside CBIT, which we both do. A, an OT does not have to be CBIT trained. I don't have to know even what CBIT stands for to still be able to effectively help your child through this process and you through this process. Great, thank you, okay. What if your child always uses avoidance and asks for space every time something challenging comes up? What if you try to schedule a different time to talk about things, but the minute it's brought up, the child gets overwhelmed and shuts down? It seems like we can never move forward or address anything. Do you wanna take that one, Heather? Sure, sure. I would, I would think I would start with, without knowing the child, I would definitely start with some sort of emotional ID program, meaning I try to figure out um, when is their emotions at a point where I could talk to them, right? So using Dr. Ross Green's uh, talk earlier where he was talking about um, plan collaborative problem solving and you have to say you know i see that it's hard for, I, I see that you don't want to talk to me um but it makes it hard for us to do x y and z is there is there a time or a way that we could talk about this right and and first off problem solve and see when we can talk right knowing that not talking at all is not an option um and then trying to figure out like hey, it looks like you're in a really good space when you're playing video games. Is there a way that like we can do that like right beforehand or right after or you know, whatever it might be, but trying to figure out a time when emotions are at a place where it is. And it might be that they just don't know how to talk about it, so it feels really hard to do. And so that might be part of the um, collaborative problem solving because knowing how to talk about emotions is very, very hard. Um, and so I would, I would start with that um, Dr. Ross Green's act of problem solving, trying to figure out why they won't talk about it 
um, to try to figure out how to to start there. And if you need a third party, like be uh, like a therapist, that might be another option because sometimes they talk to therapists a lot more than they talk to parents. Um, so that's that's my gut. Yeah, I would agree with that. Great, thank you. Okay. Um, at the end, Heather, you discussed some resources, but someone has a specific question about what resources parents can use to teach emotional regulation skills. We live in a provider vacuum and virtual therapy hasn't been effective, so it's up to her. Sure, well, the free one is that Leaky Breaks resource. It's free, it's tick specific, it, um, it's all online and you can, you can watch videos. Um, it's a little bit kid friendly, but I have used the concepts with adults. So um, that is a great option. You can also purchase the zones of regulation program um, and learn how to do that on your own. So there's a lot of those resources um, you can do um, on your own. Um, it just tends to be a little bit easier, but the leaky breaks resource is easy and it's tick specific. Um, and I would, I would start there and they, it's, um, it's wonderful. It is a great program. They also on the website have free downloadables for posters that you can put in the child's room, things that you can send to school because, you know, obviously, um, I, I don't know that we mentioned this specifically, but, you know, you want consistency between the different environments. So you're going to want to get school on board with this as well if your child is actually going to school in person. Um, so, you know, the, the resources from um, the CPRI is, uh, are, are right there. They're downloadable. Like, like Heather said, they're free. Um, it's very kid-friendly. Kids really enjoy watching the videos um, and really kids of all ages. Um, I mean, the guy's kind of quirky and, you know, he just, he's very engaging. And um, so it's, it's, a, it's a terrific program. Great, thank you. All right, we have yeah, about four more minutes. Get in from this program, just to be clear. <laughs> We just like it. <laughs> All right, we have a few more minutes. So I'll take a few more questions. Um, next one. My older daughter often parents her TS sibling. She gets in trouble for getting involved. It sounds like instead we should be encouraging her to offer suggestions on how to handle the escalated situations with her sister. Am I understanding that correctly? Yeah, I think, I mean, it sounds like, you know, you've got a, a real helper and and somebody who wants to be engaged so you know give her the the tools and sort of the permission to to do that in in the best most effective way for for the child so instead of parenting and and maybe protecting a bit um you know move that to um let's let's signal your sister to, to use her skills and her strategies um, that she has in place instead of you know acting maybe as a buffer or or too much of a protector for her um, you know your sister needs to to learn how to use her skills and it's it's okay if you want to to cue her when it's time until she's able to do that on her own but then step back and let her do that um, and then maybe maybe the the child that that is the the good parent or tries to parent too can be more um, you know take on more of a role in the debriefing um, where they're, you know, helping to really acknowledge the effort that sister put into it. Um, and, you know, sometimes, you know, your, your kids have a, a totally different perspective of what's happening than you do and, and see it in a different light. I think family meetings are a great place for that too, right? And making sure that your child with TS feels like that's productive and helpful, right? And making sure that that feels really good for them. Great. Okay, next question. A little bit of a loaded question, I think a hot topic of discussion amongst uh, our community, but do you consider Tourette to be a disorder of disinhibition, or does the disinhibition stem from the co-occurring conditions with TS manif that, that manifest with TS? Well, it's the lack of filter, right? So I don't want to get into the, the um, I want to get into the debate, but we know that there's, um, we do know um, at this point, or at least what we know in research, is that there's a dysfunction in the basal ganglia, which is the gatekeeper and the filter of the brain. So we do know that there is um, difficulty with, um, with making uh, no decisions. And then the frontal part of the brain, which is the executive function inhibition, 
um, part of the brain and so there is mouse circuitry in the brain um, now those all that also happens with ADHD and co-occurring conditions as well so um, I just not sure if there's enough um, I am NOT a neuroscientist so I can't speak on that um, I'm not sure if there's enough literature um, and I think we're still in the very early stages of TS neuroscience to know um, the answer to that question um, but we do know that the basal ganglia and the frontal cortex are involved and that is um, that is a big part of why a lot of these um, symptoms occur Right. And I would say one of the members on our team, uh, Dr. Keith Kaufman, would be an excellent person to address this, you know, question and maybe give more detail to this as well. Yeah, definitely. He is giving a talk later this afternoon, actually. Yes. Um, so definitely check that out. Okay, we'll take one more question. Do you have suggestions if a spouse does not understand the child's diagnosis and really think this is more behavioral and the child acting out? He doesn't participate in the child's needs regarding Tourette's clinically. Any suggestions or potential resources? Well, you're you're kind of looking at two women who, you know, clinically just kind of lay it on the line. Um, and <laughs> when we see a parent that's not on board, we we tend to to deal with that head on. Um, so I know if if we were to see you and in your your spouse and, and your child in, in clinic, we would Pretty much call it as we're seeing it um you know that everybody needs to be on board and you know what can we do to get people on board because really the only thing that matters is the success of your child um and you know if if you if, if an individual if a spouse or a, a teacher or another adult that's significant in this child's life can't get there then you know you're gonna have to figure out another way to proceed um, or can't or won't I should say get there um, and get on board then you're gonna have to figure out a way to just um, you know kind of carve out that side and you know work within the the entities that are on board um, it's much more difficult and you will have many more uh, pitfalls as a result um, because it's very hard to you know to cancel out a significant person in that child's life um, you know, hopefully with the progress that you and the rest of the family and your child make, then that, that person can see what's happening and hopefully have a, an attitude and, and um, you know, thought change about what's, what's actually occurring. And I would say some resources, um, support groups. I know um, the Tread Association just started a virtual support group and one specifically for dads. Um, and that might be a really um, helpful resource as well um, that could be um, a potential area where your husband can just join in and just listen to other conversations and ask the questions that he wants to ask um, and, and maybe get them answered. That's a good point, yeah. Wonderful. Well, that is all the time that we have for our presentation. Thank you both again for providing such a great resource um, and with all the information that you presented. We didn't get through everyone's questions, but as I mentioned, we will be collecting them and sending them off to our speakers so they can um, give a little bit more information to you all. Um, I highly recommend those in, um, with questions about CBIT take a look at the um, other session, sessions that we have going on across the next day or so, um, there are some great ones out there to learn more about some of the questions that we had. So um, just as a reminder, once the session is closed, you'll receive a survey on the presentation, and we would greatly appreciate it if you would complete that and provide your feedback. You will also receive a follow-up email within 24 to 48 hours that has a link to view the recording of the session. The sessions from this afternoon and throughout the conference will be also posted on the TA's YouTube channel for anyone who was unable to participate today. Lastly, we do encourage you to reach out to us about this virtual conference or for other ideas and suggestions that you may have. This presentation was presented free of charge thanks to our generous donors. So if you appreciated the session, we welcome you to support the organization at Tourette.org um, and, and donate. So on behalf of the Tourette Association, thank you again for joining us and taking the time to view our presentation. Thanks so much, Dr. Simpson and Dr. Rao. Um, we look forward to seeing everyone on some additional sessions this afternoon. Thanks again. Bye.